The story begins with being given this Ellington player piano by the estate of Virginia Clark. After researching the serial number found on the brass soundboard, it was determined to be a 1914 Ellington player piano. It's over 107 years old. The Ellington Piano Company was one of the top brand name pianos built by the famous Baldwin Piano and Organ Company of Cincinnati. It was established in 1893 and Ellington was a major contributor to the piano industry at large during the first quarter of the 20th century. Ellington built several lines of high quality pianos, including this player piano under the Manuela label. Although the Baldwin Piano and Organ remained successfully active throughout the 20th century, Ellington pianos were discontinued around 1930 due to the onset of the Great Depression. Well, there's your history lesson for the day. So let's get back to this piano. So even though the piano itself and the keys, everything worked, it was pretty evident that the player piano part of this piano had deteriorated or it can no longer be used in that capacity. And so it was going to require every part of the player system to be either replaced or restored. And so this journal is a record of that restoration. So player pianos actually work on a pneumatic system where a vacuum is built up by bellows that are driven by pedals underneath the piano as shown in these pictures. This vacuum also drives an air motor, shown on the right. And this engages the music paper roll and causes it to pull over a metal tracker bar with a row of holes that corresponds to the 88 keys in the piano. And when a hole in the paper roll passes over the tracker bar, it allows atmospheric air to travel through a tube, lift a corresponding membrane, which opens a valve and closes a little pneumatic bellow attached to a wooden finger that moves a hammer that strikes the note. So this is quite an ingenious engineering contraption for its time. And remember that in the early 1900s, in order for people to listen to live music in their home, this was the first device to allow. So the first step in the restoration process was removing the upper player action here shown in this picture. And this is the one that contains the air motor, the transmission, the roll box. And underneath all this is the pneumatics. And if you look at the back side of this action, you can see the tubing that goes in the tracker bar to each valve that connects to the pneumatic bellows. So you can also see the wooden fingers on the bellows here that strike the notes. So the action has three layers of what we call pneumatic boards, and this is where the 88 bellows are distributed. The rubber tubing was so old that it was brittle, gray, and just crumbled when it was touched. And then the pneumatic cloth on the bellows, which is a rubberized cotton cloth, so dry rotted it just easily tore. So it's probably very likely that this player action wasn't removed since it was purchased. And it's evident from just the dry rot, the brittleness, and all the layers of black dust on everything. So now that the um, upper stack is removed, um, I ended up start breaking everything down and uh, ended up first the first three parts of these pneumatic boards and uh, basically all the brackets and screws are removed and labeled and bagged up. Um, you know, these, these boards contain the individual uh, bellows, or the pneumatics they call them, and they call the pneumatic pouch membranes, lifters, and valves that you see here in these pictures. And then now I had to remove the bellows and break apart the uh, pneumatic boards to get to all those components. So, uh, to be honest, this is probably one of the messes, hardest jobs, because each pillow had to be heated with a heat gun and pried off with a scraper, as when they built these, they used hide glue to attach the components. Now, hide glue has a property where it's extremely strong when dry, but it softens when heated, and you're able to separate wooden parts without severely damaging the wood, so this was very important. Um, because obviously I don't want to have to remake a lot of these parts, but as you'll see um, later, I actually did have to make some new parts for these. So the pneumatic board separates into two pieces, the pouch board and the valve board. So let's start with the pouch board first on what I did. So the lower section contains the leather pouch membranes that the mushroom-shaped lifters are glued to, as shown here. So each wooden lifter has to be removed from the leather pouch membrane. At the center of each mushroom-shaped lifter is a bleed hole made from celluloid. 
This bleed hole plays an important part to ensure pressures are equalized for the bellows to return back to normal and be ready to strike another note. This occurs in milliseconds. In fact, this bellow can open and close literally eight times in a second. So the old leather pouch member had to be scraped off because it was old and the board sanded to remove any pouch material and glue. Underneath the leather pouch is the pouch well. And that needed to be cleaned, sanded, and then resealed with shellac to ensure air tightness. Once all three pouch boards are cleaned up, it was time to install new leather pouch membranes. Now these leather pouches are only 0.01 inches thick, and they have a hole in the center for the bleed hole in the lifter. Now each pouch must be centered and glued in the pouch well while forming a 1 8 inch dip in the center. And there also needs to be a way to glue this to the edge of the well and form a dip without getting glue all over the pouch. So for this, I designed and 3D printed a pouch setting tool as shown on the picture here and made sure it has the proper dip. It's designed so the pouch can be placed over the stem of the pouch setting tool to keep it centered and then a vacuum is pulled so the pouch leather holds tight against the pouch setter. The stem of the tool is turned upside down with a leather pouch secured by the vacuum to align with the hole in the pouch well. And then the tool edge aligns with the pouch well edge, so the pouch leather contacts the glue, the tool holds it down. And then the vacuum is released and the tool is removed, leaving the leather pouch in place, and voila, you have a centered pouch with a nice little dip. And all 88 leather pouches were installed using this technique. The next step is ensuring the mushroom lifters are centered and glued on the pouch. And this required another 3D printed tool. In this case, as shown here, the tool had a stem that centered the back side of the pouch and the number 57 drill bit that protrudes up the center of the tool. So this allows the lifter to be glued with the bleed hole placed over the, that drill bit until the lifter contacted the pouch. And this allowed each lifter to be perfectly centered. So this completes the restoration of the lower pouch board. Now onto the valve board. So the valve board is divided into an upper valve cover and a lower valve board. The upper valve cover attaches to the lower valve board with a leather gasket between them, which needed to be replaced. And both the upper valve cover and the lower valve board contain metal grommet seats that the leather valve facings rest on to open and close the valves, which switches the pressure within the system and activates the bellows that sit above them on the board. Now once the cover is removed, it reveals the leather valves attached to the metal valve stem. Now these valve stems rest on the mushroom lifters on the pouch board. So all 88 valves and stems are removed, and then the valve cover and valve board were cleaned, the gaskets removed, and the board sanded. The grommet seats were cleaned with 4-0 uh, steel wool to ensure the leather valve facing seal well against them. And then a layer of shellac was brushed around the valve seat to ensure they were sealed well. Now the valve stem holds the leather valve facings as shown. Each one of these valves were taken apart. And this is what the valve stem looks like broken down into its individual parts. Now the upper and lower valve facings are glued to a very thin brass disc and separated by a little wooden spacer. Now the gap between the upper valve facing and the grommet seat must be regulated later in the process. And this is done by the paper spacers underneath the brass disc that you see. Now the old leather valve facings were removed off the brass disc and thrown away and these brass discs were sanded on both sides to remove old glue and leather. Steel wool was used on the valve stems to remove any residue. And then the blue and white disc paper spacers uh, of varying thicknesses will be kept for the gapping process later. Now these new leather valve facings, which is actually goat skin leather, they have a thickness of about 0.04 inches and they're glued on the clean brass disc. Now these will be reinserted in the valve board later. Now that the pouch and valve boards are restored, it's time to reassemble. Okay, so here's a progression of the restored pouch board. The mushroom lifters added to the pouches, and then the lower valve board assembled to the pouch board with the wooden pillar support. So then both sides need to be recovered with strips of what is it's called seal cloth. It's just a heavy cotton rubberized cloth and this just ensures a tight seal for the vacuum. Now on the side where the bell is attached, each individual slot needed to be cut out. 
of the silk cloth with an exacto knife. That was fun. Anyway, leather gaskets uh, were cut out of uh, 0.04 inch thick material of leather, and uh, I used an arc punch, which is basically just a heavy mallet with a um, sharp hole center, and that was used to punch out the one and a quarter inch holes. Now for future gaskets, I learned my lesson, so I ended up, I got a dial laser cutter, and it made cutting leather much easier. So these gaskets were glued down to the lower valve board, and this provides a good seal, so when the upper valve board is attached, <clears throat> we get that another good seal for the backing. So this process was repeated for all three pneumatic boards. So once complete, it was time to add in the restored valves and stems and then ensure the proper gap between the upper valves and the seats. To ensure each valve activates quickly and then recovers just as quickly, the gap between the upper valve cover with the metal grommet and the upper le leather valve facing needs to be at 0 0.046 inches as illustrated here. Now to measure this gap, I would use a small tube to blow into the pouch board as if a note is being played, which lifts the pouch and its mushroom lifter, which lifts the valve stem until the leather facing makes contact with the grommet. Now this distance that the valve stem travels above the valve cover is measured using a micrometer on a specially designed 3D printed stand. I know, I love using a 3D printer. Anyway, if the gap was larger than 0.046 inches, then I would add different paper spacers underneath the brass disc to close the gap. And if the gap was smaller than 0.046 inch, I would sand down the wooden spacer in the middle. Needless to say, this is a very tedious process as each valve needed some sort of adjustment. Well, after completing this step, it feels like I should be done, right? Well, remember those 88 pneumatic bellows I removed off the boards? Well, each one of those needs to be fully restored and recovered. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Well. There's no need to share all the pictures of removing the old, dirty, dry-rotted cloth and hinges, sanding the bellows boards, or even the contents of my nose afterwards. If you recall earlier when I mentioned about disassembling the glued-on bellows from the pneumatic boards, some of the bottom boards, which are made of poplar, were being a bit stubborn, and I was being a bit impatient, so several of them splintered or left pieces behind that they would need to be totally replaced. Now, for the fan of heart, this may not have been an easy task. I have a dad that knows woodworking and has a shop in Oregon. So 2,300 miles later, and the guidance of my dad, I remade the damaged boards, and since I was on a roll, I decided I might as well replace all the bottom boards. Now, you will notice that everything is numbered 1 through 88, and that is because many of the individual components are sized to fit with other components, and everything should go back to where it was to ensure alignment in the piano. I can't tell you. The number 88 was in my dreams just about every night during this restoration. Well, after everything is cleaned up, the first step is to rehinge the boards. The cloth material used for the hinges is called pillow ticking, and with the lines on the cloth, it makes it easy to align everything. The hide glue is used to attach the hinges to the upper and lower pneumatic boards. And a plastic sheet is placed between the hinges to prevent them sticking together. And then the boards are closed and held in place with rubber bands to dry overnight. Now I made a fixture for an iron to lay horizontally with a metal plate on top. And this is used in many steps where heating the wood pieces prior to assembly helps the glue spread and soak into the material for a stronger bond. The next step is recovering the pneumatic bellows with the new rubberized cloth. Now an important measurement that was taken before the old bellows were worn out was the bellow gap as shown here. This is important because as the bellow collapses when the valve activates, it only needs to move far enough so the finger on the hinge end moves just enough to strike the piano key. Not enough gap and the note doesn't strike. Too much gap and the note may not repeat fast enough. To ensure the gap was consistent for all the bellows, a jig was made out of wood shown here. I can't believe I missed my opportunity to 3D print one. Of course, the ends of the bellow boards are covered in high glue then and placed over the jig to get the correct gap. And then this is placed in the center of the strip of pneumatic cloth. Now, once dry on the ends, then each side is coated with glue and the cloth is stretched over it. Before the glue is completely dry, the cloth is trimmed on the sides and the gap end before the bellows are held shut with rubber bands to create the folds. And then the hinge end cloth is glued down. The 
quick test was done to check the air tightness by closing off the slotted hole on the bottom board and verifying the bellow would not close, or open for that matter. Once all the bellows are done, it's time to mount them to the restored pneumatic boards. Once again, it's important each bellow is mounted in the same location as it was removed. And this time, I did 3D print a little jig to position them and made sure they aligned over the holes in the board. A heavy coat of hide glue is important while holding down the bellow by hand for 30 seconds to ensure a good bond and seal. Now once all the bellows are attached, it was time to test to see if each individual bellow on the three pneumatic boards could hold a good vacuum and the valves operated as designed. Now it's important to do this bench test and fix any valve or bellow issues before everything is reassembled. Taking this apart the first time was good enough. Now here you will see me with one of the boards on a stand. The holes on the back are covered over with blue painter's tape to ensure a tight seal. And then a vacuum was attached to one end of the pneumatic board. With the holes closed, the bellows remain open. As I remove the tape from the holes from the one section, it simulates an opening in the music roll and therefore introducing atmospheric air into the valve and as seen in the video, the bellows collapse. Now another test is performed by me placing my finger over one of the holes and tapping it on and off the hole to see how quickly the valve works and the bellow repeats. As I mentioned earlier, if the gap is correct, a note could repeat eight times in a second. I was able to identify a couple of valves that needed a little work during this testing, so it was time well spent. Now I'll come back later for the final assembly of the pneumatic boards when it's time to add the tube into the tracker bar. But for now, let's move on to the air motor restoration. Now the air motor on the player is responsible for moving the gears on the transmission that drives the music roll to move across the tracker bar, as well as drives the transmission to rewind the music roll when the rewind lever is activated. Now the speed of the air motor is controlled by the governor, which I will discuss later. But essentially it controls the amount of vacuum pulled on the air motor. Lower vacuum, lower speed for lower tempo music. And higher vacuum, higher speed for higher tempos, as well as rewinding. Now this air motor consists of four bellows connected to a crankshaft with fingers, which then are connected to corresponding slider valves that cover and uncover valve holes, which introduce air vacuum to open and close the bellows. The sliders are similar to pistons in a car motor, and so the timing of these slider valves is critical so that the crankshaft can turn at high and low speeds smoothly. So the first step is taking everything apart to remove all the old material like the bellows, cloth hinges, and leather gaskets. Now this picture shows all the parts cleaned up. The air motor bellows are hinged and recovered similar to the pneumatic board bellows except the cloth is a little bit heavier for the air motor bellows due to more stress. Now to reduce any friction, the old felt bushings on the crankshaft fingers were replaced and to also ensure the slider valves move smoothly against the valve boards, graphite mixed with alcohol was brushed on both parts and burnished to give a slick surface. And once everything was reassembled, it was time to test how well it worked. It doesn't take much of a vacuum to power the motor. As you can see in the video, I'm holding the vacuum head about an inch away from the inlet to get it to move. I love it when things start coming together. And then you can see from the back side here, and then the actual bellows moving here in unison. So everything looks good and uh, we're ready to put that aside and work on the next part. The next part of the upper player action we focused on was the spool box, transmission, and tracking device as shown here. The spool box holds the music rolls, mounting pins, tracker bar, and music spool. And the transmission is the link between the air motor and the spool box. The tracking device is another pneumatic bellow that has tubing connected to the tracker bar and linkages back to the transmission. The role of the tracking device is to detect when the music roll starts to move to either side of the tracker bar during play. And it activates a bellow to move the mechanical linkage to the transmission that makes a minor adjustment to the music roll mounting pins to recenter the paper. Pretty complicated stuff, unless you're a geeky engineer like me. Now the first task was to disassemble the spool box and get the tracker bar and spool out. As you can see, the old brittle tubing is still attached to the end of the tracker bar tubing, so I had to chip all that off. And here's the cleaned up back side of the tracker bar. And then I was off to the buffing wheel to get that brass on the tracker bar and spool shining again. 
Here are the before and after of the front. Now that is one shiny piece of work. Now the transmission was pretty dirty, so the main objective was getting the parts and gears uh, wiped down with solvent and cleaned up. Now this part of the transmission is to play a rewind lever, and I show that because this part here got lost somewhere. And I had to have a new one fabricated from steel, and then I painted it gloss black and attached with brass screws. No telling where the original ended up. So I also replaced the fella here as well. Now the spool box also contains a knob switch for the roll regulator or the tracking mechanism. This knob switches between using the auto roll tracking device or manually controlling the music roll from moving side to side. Now apparently music rolls with damaged edges don't do well with the auto tracker, so the manual tracker allows you to adjust as needed. As mentioned earlier, the auto tracker is just another pneumatic bellow. This one is unique because it is a double bellow. Tubing from each tracking bellow is connected to these two tabs on each side of the tracker bar. When the music roll moves too far to one side, it presses against the tab, opens a hole, and air enters the tube to the bellow, and acts similar to the other pneumatics, where a leather pouch is pushed up against the valve and causes one side of the bellow to move. Now, this movement activates this lever here, connected to each side of the music roll mounting pins, and it causes it to move the music paper back to the center of the tracking bar. Now like the other pneumatics, I needed to break down the whole assembly and replace the bellows, hinge, and cloth, leather pouches, leather valves, and gaskets. And here is the final restored piece. This completes the upper stack restoration before the retubing begins. Before I could retube, I needed to get all the fingers attached to the pneumatics, assemble the pneumatic boards, and attach the tracker bar. So now it's time to measure, cut, and attach the neoprene tubing from each tracker bar tube to its corresponding pneumatic. Now if I get this part wrong, the music roll will not play the right notes, and it will sound something like, well, like someone's phase music. So the final step is assembling the transmission spool box and auto tracking device. Now thank goodness for all the pictures I took during disassembly, and I'm happy to report that I had no extra pieces or missing pieces that you know about. Then I did a test using an actual music roll. In this case, it was The Sound of Music. With the backing being pulled and me manually turning the gears, I was able to watch the bellows open and close in the front and the fingers move in the back as the holes from the music passed over the tracker bar. Now, of course, I was humming, climb every mountain, ford every stream, after completing this test because that's what it felt like restoring this thing. Anyway, I'll attach the air motor later once the lower bellow session is restored. This completes the restoration of the upper stack assembly in part one of this video. Part two will be focused on the lower player action assembly, the bellows and pumping system.